Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to um, our foreign policy talk series. This is a joint initiative of the Center for International European Studies at Kadir Has University, together with uh, UIC Panorama, the International Relations Council of Turkey a Panorama Initiative. Uh, it's a series that started online during the quarantine in the spring, uh, where we've already had three webinars uh, dealing with uh, Greek-Turkish relations, the Black Sea, um, and other issues. And here's our first fall seminar. And of course, uh, given the situation developments in, in the South Caucasus, uh, we decided that uh, our first fall seminar would be about the South Caucasus. So uh, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll uh, give the floor to Mustafa Aydin, who will be moderating the session to introduce the speakers and uh, go on with the webinar. Mustafa. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, it's nice to be back uh, with this foreign policy talk series. And of course, it's nice to have friends joining us uh, from different parts of the world, although we are not able to be together uh, face to face. We are together, nevertheless, through uh, this uh, uh, online event. Um, of course, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are again going to talk about a crisis, a flare up in the Caucasus. Uh, a warfare, uh, a conflict that has been actually going on for some time. Uh, not only the, the recent flare-up between Azerbaijan and, and Armenia, but we are going, going to dig up a little bit deeper uh, to look into the Nagorno-Karabakh. This issue, this uh, problem, uh, however you like to define it. Um, today, we have uh, three speakers with us. All of them actually uh, have been veterans of the Caucasus uh, and the wider area. They have been working and talking about these issues uh, from different angles and on different uh, institutions. Uh, but let me introduce them very briefly. Uh, uh, we have Niku Popescu, uh, who is currently director of wider Europe program in European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he was uh, a, a foreign minister and European Integration Minister of Moldova uh, in 2019. Uh, but we have, uh, we go back quite a long time with uh, Niku. He's been around the Black Sea, uh, among the crowd of the Black Sea learners. And uh, he brings always the table a different, uh, somewhat uh, definitely interesting uh, position and, uh, and observations uh, regarding Caucasus and also the Caucasus uh, and Black Sea. Uh, then we have Brenda Schaffer. Uh, she is also no stranger to the region, having worked uh, almost every aspect of the region. Uh, when I met her, I think I met her in Iran for the first time. She was working on the energy issues at the time. Uh, she is currently senior fellow, Atlantic Council, and also research faculty member of U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, and she was just telling us that she's writing a book currently. So we'll be uh, looking forward to read it. Uh, she has been involved in the Caucasus, uh, especially in Azerbaijan and energy issues. Uh, and she has widely traveled, of course, to the region a number of times and written quite uh, extensively. And finally, we have Mitat Çelikpola uh, of uh, Kadiras University, our own guy here uh, in Istanbul. Uh, he's currently vice rector of Kadiras University, but also a professor of international relations at the Department of international relations. Um, he also is somebody who has traveled extensively in the region. I think there is no place in the mountains in three Caucasus <laughs> countries yes. that he hasn't been to. <laughs> um, so he's also a very uh, suitable person tonight to, to delve into all this issue. Um, today, um, tonight, in Istanbul at least, tonight, uh, we are going to talk about Karabakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, and look, trying to see, uh, try to enlighten uh, us, first of all, but also our audience, uh, what is at stake, what's happening, why it's happening, why now, people are asking uh, these kind of questions, why now, why after all these years, we were told that this was a frozen conflict, when it's unfrozen, why it's unfrozen, and what can we do uh, now um, to, to move towards future? Um, we had some uh, talk among ourselves. Everybody knows 
what their role are. So I'm not going to tell you what their role. Uh, you will uh, understand when you start listening to them. Let me start with uh, Nico here. Um, uh, we agreed that um, the speakers will have about eight to 10 minutes first, and we'll go into the second round and the questions. Uh, Nico, would you like to start now? Thank you, Mustafa Dimitrios. It's great to see so many friends, both on the panel and among the attendees. Uh, I presumably three weeks into this new outbreak of a, a new mini small war around Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, I guess we don't have to do the basics. So I'll quickly throw in a couple of observations uh, that would help us analyze. So the situation. And to do that, I will go to uh, a rule of conflict settlement formulated by Jonathan Powell, who was the chief negotiator of the conflict settlement in Northern Ireland and one of the architects of the Good Friday Agreement. And his formula is that you get the settlement of a conflict has a chance when the sides in this conflict are engaged in a mutually hurting stalemate. Uh, so this is when both sides have an interest to find a way to settle a conflict. And we obviously did not have this situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, and that is why the conflict has been erupting once in a while. And we had a stalemate, a status quo, where Armenia, which basically won the war, which ended in 94, was not in a situation of a hurting stalemate. Armenia considered itself in a favorable position, and it was very hard to find the internal energy and acceptance in Armenian society to start moving on towards the implementation of the Madrid principles. On the other hand, we had a stalemate which was very hurtful for Azerbaijan. And as we could see, uh, Azerbaijan has been very open about its desire to re redo and remake the status quo, ideally for negotiations, but if not, the message has been clear for over a decade that if the status quo is not changed through negotiations, the risk of war uh, and military action is, uh, is much greater. So this is where we were. Uh, you know, it's very often in the post-Soviet space that people get surprised, you know, with new surprises of new military actions, or, you know, sometimes people get surprised by Russia, sometimes people get surprised by Armenia, Azerbaijan. But very often people have been saying and leaders have been saying what they are going to do, more or less explicitly and openly. And uh, that's one of those cases where this uh, probability of a new war uh, outbreak of the war has been there on the cards and everyone knew it. I'll say a couple of things also about Russia and the EU. Um, if I, I've been looking, of course, carefully at the Russian messaging in the last uh, three weeks. And I see what is on the surface, a huge paradox. I will explain it and it's not surprising, but it's nonetheless a paradox. If you go back to 2014, when uh, 2013, when Ukraine was preparing to sign an association agreement with the European Union and have a free trade area. If you went to the Russian MFA website and you listened to Russian foreign policymakers, it looked like it's the end of a geopolitical era. Uh, it was daily news in Russia what's happening with Europe's and Ukraine's desire to sign a free trade area. Uh, it was presented in Russia as a major geopolitical catastrophe for Russia if Ukraine trades more with the European Union, which is quite absurd, but that is how it was presented. Even today, if you go on the Russian MFA website, you will see that there is a special section dedicated to Ukraine, a special section dedicated to Syria, but no special section dedicated to the current outbreak of the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. The paradox here is that if you look at Russian foreign policy messaging today, you have a situation where a Russian military ally a member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, a member of the Eurasian Union is engaged in a war with Azerbaijan and with possible contributions from elsewhere, as you know. And yet Russian diplomacy is not outraged. Uh, Russian diplomacy is not rushing to defend its uh, ally. Now, of course, legally Nagorno-Karabakh and the occupied territories of Azerbaijan are not 
supposed to be militarily protected by uh, by the CSTO agreement. But still, it's a Russian ally in a warlike situation, and Russia has been very neutral. It's very obvious Russia is maintaining this neutrality uh, line between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, presumably, I expect that some Russian red lines have been communicated to Azerbaijan. Uh, it's clear that the Armenian internationally recognized border is a red line. Um, but basically, it looks, my interpretation of Russian foreign policy is that basically Russia offers some space of a will of, of time, if you want, and freedom of maneuver for Azerbaijan to start recapturing some territories. I am not very sure if this includes Nagorno-Karabakh region itself, but it's obvious that Russia does not mind if Azerbaijan starts recapturing parts of the seven districts around Nagorno-Karabakh. And the Russian calculation there seems to be that if Azerbaijan does so and Russia does not interfere too much, Azerbaijan will be a grateful neighbor for quite some time. And Armenia has nowhere to go. Armenians will have to accept that. France might be supportive, more supportive of Armenia in foreign policy statements. But Moscow knows, Yerevan knows that France will not send troops to Armenia. And the only country which would send troops to defend Armenia, if the calculation is right, is Russia. So even if the Armenians will be unhappy with this Russian neutrality for a while, they don't have a lot of alternatives. That's the Russian calculation, which allows them to see in the next stages both a friendly Azerbaijan that recaptures territory and an Armenia that has no choice but stay a more or less loyal Russian ally, even if Armenian public opinion will, of course, not be very positive about these developments. But as you know, not all governments care equally about public opinion um, abroad, especially. The European Union, <clears throat> the European Union is not in a very good position. In 2009, I published a book called the EU and the post-Soviet conflicts. It had a chapter which was called the European Union's non-involvement in Nagorno-Karabakh. And nothing changed from what I wrote about the EU role in Nagorno-Karabakh in the last 11 years. I, I reopened the chapter now and it stands. You can easily republish it. Now, the European Union has tried to play a role in Nagorno-Karabakh and Abkhazia and South Ossetia around 2005-2006. It managed to play a slightly bigger role in Georgia's conflicts. In Azerbaijan, the EU could not do that. Azerbaijan was not very eager to have the European Union on board for several reasons, and we can dig into that. Armenia was not pushing very hard either. With time, Azerbaijan was very reluctant of letting the European Union go inside the conflict zone to do post-conflict rehabilitation. And the EU has been doing that for a while in South Ossetia and Abkhazia and Transnistria, but it was not allowed to do that in Nagorno-Karabakh by Baku for reasons that we can discuss and they are understandable. Uh, the EU offered peacekeepers, but as we know, there has been no progress on the Madrid principles and there is no serious conversation about peacekeepers. And even if there is, I think it's not very clear which peacekeepers the sides would want. Uh, we will see. But basically the EU is not in a position that makes it a very strong player at this stage. But that's primarily because unlike Georgia or Moldova, which asked for greater EU involvement in conflict settlement, neither Armenia nor Azerbaijan really wanted such a role. What comes next? Uh, one minute, maybe. I think that it's very clear to everyone that lands have to change hands. How much and for what means is not clear. But without a move where Azerbaijan regains significant parts of its seven districts, uh, there will be other wars. 
I think that's also increasingly clear in Armenia, and this war will hopefully also re-energize diplomacy. Uh, but now the question is, you know, at what stage do we arrive to a stalemate that hurts both Armenia and Azerbaijan so that talks have a chance? And on, in theory, that stalemate is a situation where Armenia got the message and starts moving on the Madrid principles, but Azerbaijan also understands that it cannot capture all of it through force because it's too costly and it's too difficult and therefore the talks are a preferable way to regain uh, control of what is legally Azerbaijani territory. So that is, I think, the prospects. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nico. That was a great start, uh, as you would all, all have understood by now. I asked Nico uh, to talk about the role of EU-Russia uh, as well, uh, and as well as his views on the, uh, on the conflict. Um, so let's go to Brenda. Uh, and uh, in addition to the general atmosphere and what you are seeing is happening in the region, uh, I also ask uh, Brenda to talk a little bit more about U.S., Israel, and if possible, Iranian positions also. Uh, Brenda, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm very happy to be a part of this and to see old friends. I'm a bit jealous that you're in Istanbul. I even, uh, I'm thinking of a Friday evening in Istanbul and the weather is even nice and clear and warm but not hot. So uh, I, I, I really would prefer we would be actually conducting this seminar in Istanbul itself. Um, I think to understand the current developments in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict, first of all, we need to look at this as round two of fighting that began in July. Uh, you can't really understand it if you don't look also at that round uh, that took place. So, so what happened in July, uh, uh, for maybe for our wider audience, um, uh, Armenia attacked military and civilian positions in the north of Azerbaijan, 300 kilometers north of the uh, current conflict zone, very close uh, to the pipeline corridor, to the, all the major energy and transport corridors. This is weeks before the full corridor is supposed to become operational. And in fact, even this week, TAP opened. It probably would have been a much bigger ceremonial event if a you know, war wasn't uh, taking place. But Armenia tried to capture hills that really basically overlook the corridor and, and, and could threaten the, the, the corridor. Um, and this was probably in coordination with Russia, a strong message, I think, to the United States that, that not clear that the United States could understand this message, but you know, after the US basically froze Nord Stream uh, very close to its completion, um, here's sort of a, a, an attack on or near the, the American project, which is the Southern Gas Corridor uh, into Europe. Um, and also I think it could create an attempt to create some commercial chill as, as, uh, as Azerbaijan and the investors partners start to look into the second stage of, of, of development. Um, the second, and I totally echo what Niku said about that, actually leaders often say what, what they mean and you should listen to them and they, they, you know, they, they do it. Um, uh, a year and a half ago, Armenia's defense minister, David Tonunyan, articulated uh, very clearly a doctrine, new, new wars for new territories. And the idea was that it was clear that there's somewhat of a, sta a military stalemate, you know, trenches, soldiers face to face. Uh, in, in the line of contact in the occupied territories. 2016, maybe even Azerbaijan has a ad military advantage. So try to move the war to other parts of Azerbaijan. And they, he said it very openly, you know, make the um, Azerbaijan fear that if they try to make any move to recapture their territories, that they actually can lose additional territories in at the, you know, the undisputed borders uh, with Azerbaijan. And something that was a bit overlooked, but this week we understand now what that was during July, um, and a lot of media didn't report this, but Nakhchivan was shelled as well. It wasn't just the Tobuz region in the north, but Nakhchivan as well. So basically showing Azerbaijan or trying to show Azerbaijan that the whole country uh, is vulnerable to the Armenian uh, uh, military. And, and, and uh, uh, Armenian officials, I was pretty surprised, have actually even confirmed that, you know, that they, they initiated this on the eve of the, you know, the pipeline uh, 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 opening. Um, 
Um, and so, so what we have is a situation that obviously Azerbaijan couldn't leave that kind of strategic vulnerability where a new front had just been opened, Nakhchivan had been shelled. I don't know who initiated the current round of uh, fighting, but you know, clearly it was a situation that was intolerable to Azerbaijan to not have a response and change this new strategic reality that Armenia had established in July. It, ha it had to be, it, it had, it had to be uh, uh, changed. Um, and um, um, so, 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 uh, so I think you definitely need to see uh, the, this is stage two of a of a two staged uh, rounds of rounds of fighting. Um, so first, a little bit, what are some of the energy uh, aspects here? So one, I pointed out part of the background: the opening of TAP, uh, U.S. freezing of Nord Stream. Um, but what what we learn, I think, from the last couple of years of conflicts, and this is especially relevant to Turkey, is that cross border uh, uh, pipelines are largely Im immune to conflicts. So even you know with the crisis between Russia and Turkey after the downing of a Russian a Russian plane, you know you had freezing of tourism, freezing of uh, vegetable trade, but the gas flow continued undisrupted. You know it was too important to both sides. Is it Turkey an important Russian market? Uh, Turkey needing at the time those Russian gas supplies. So the, the pipeline was immune uh, or UAE Qatar, even when they have uh, political arguments, cutting off, you know, gas flows. Algeria, Morocco, the, Algeria, the uh, international pipeline of Algeria goes to Southern Europe, goes through Morocco, you know, Morocco even at times they're basically having a proxy war between them. So uh, uh, the physical uh, pipe, you know, pipelines are more secure, especially most of them being underground uh, than in the past. And even, in, and even um, you know, we were just talking earlier that you know, even Greece and Turkey might be having a stand out down in the East Med that doesn't stop gas going from Turkey into Greece and doesn't even stop the opening of a pipeline of tap that unites even more and integrates even more Greece and, 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 and uh, uh, Turkey. But I do think if there will be, you know, we're seeing that Armenia as it has additional losses it, and, and unexpected losses, it's upping the ante. So for instance, when it, when it lost territories, you know, attacking civilian populations like in Ganja in Azerbaijan itself and from Armenian territory, you know, so, so uh, escalating this way. I think the next escalation will be actually specific acts of terrorism. And so this could affect, you know, it could affect pipelines in Turkey and Georgia. It could affect infrastructure in Azerbaijan, you know, public large crowded public places in Baku, there's even been the, the, um, the government has warned uh, people not to gather in large, large places because of a higher alert for, for terrorism. So I think we will see um, um, more, more ter terrorism attempts as well as, as the fighting uh, continues. And this could be in Turkey itself, uh, uh, targeted on the infrastructure, if you recall, to, uh, August, 2008, the BTC was attacked near the Erzincan and part of the pipeline that is uh, above above ground. Uh, it, it, so, so this could happen again. Another another energy aspect is we're seeing the what I would call the weaponization of energy infrastructure. So operational energy was always a part of wars, right? Getting energy, getting your energy to su supply your troops energy to keep your, your economy functioning. But now we're actually seeing energy infrastructure turned into a weapon. So, so one is the, the missile attacks near the Migishever Dam, that if this was, it's not likely that it would have exploded, it's quite well protected and it's, uh, it's supposed to withstand earthquakes. But if they had good luck and hit in the right place, you could see really the killing of thousands of, of people and the flooding of, you know, maybe 20% of Azerbaijan's territory ruining, you know, farmland and towns and, and the villages. And, um, and, and then uh, last in July, although it was retracted by the government, a uh, lower level official in the Ministry of Defense of Azerbaijan, it said if Armenia attacks Armenia Shever Dam, um, we're going to attack their nuclear power plants. So again, this was retracted, but, uh, you know, again, because the stakes are so high, uh, we need to you know, make sure that you know, these infrastructure are out of the game, whether it's a, a, a dam or it's a nuclear power plant, Armenia's nuclear power plant. Um, 
uh, I, I, I'll leave to others to talk about Russia, but I just maybe to relate to two things that we hear a lot in the media that this idea that Russia is distracted. Anyone who thinks Russia is too distracted to deal with the South Caucasus doesn't know Russia. Russia is never, Putin's never distracted. He will always pull a rabbit out of the hat. Who, who among us anticipated Russian troops in Syria, but one morning wake up to it, there will always be a rabbit pulled out, you know, uh, pulled out of the Russian uh, hat. He's, he, and, and South Caucasus is probably more important than any other flashpoint that Russia is, is dealing with. Um, Iran, um, for, you know, I think underreported, but probably the biggest potential impact uh, beyond Armenia and Azerbaijan for any of the, 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 ex the regional powers is on Iran. We, we talk a lot about Russia, talk a lot about Turkey, but it's actually Iran. One, physically, there's somewhat of a spillover of the, you know, the fighting into Iranian territory. Um, but two, the main thing, you know, a third of the population of Iran is ethnic Azerbaijani. And well, they, you know, they, they have, the group is huge and very split, some very integrated into the Iranian system, some neutral uh, and some outright, you know, very nationalistic as Turks, as Azerbaijani Turks. Um, but war, you know, changes people. And it's probably all of you are feeling on the different social media and seeing, you know, the really blatant evidence, including on the Iranian um, media in, in, in Azerbaijani language out of, out of Tabriz of trucks and trucks, you know, Russia doesn't share a land border with Armenia. So it's, it's uh, supplies are going through Iran. They're landing at the Cas Iran's Caspian port and then taken by truck, by the way, even the contractor, I saw an interview with him, the contractor for these trucks, there's actually an Iranian Azerbaijani and, you know, showed the contract and stuff. So, so um, showing, showing these uh, trucks, you know, going into Armenia, um, this is really incensed the Iranian Azerbaijanis, and it might be something that uh, has huge implications for the regime. It's like a, you know, how how many times can you say you have Islamic solidarity? Not only when Zarif goes hands in hands in China, um, but also when you know Azerbaijanis are getting killed. They can almost physically, you know, they're going to the Hudafarin area and overlooking and you know seeing. Azerbaijani troops get killed and say, oh yeah, they have some sol solidarity with Muslims and Shia. So I think domestically there, there might be a huge price here for, uh, for, for, for Iran. Um, it's, it's Mustafa, thank you for asking me to talk about the US. I won't take a lot of time because there's nothing to talk about. Basically hardly engaged, hardly involved. That's, that's, that's pretty sad. The only thing that is very difficult that you know so all of us who follow this region we know that this conflict has nothing to do with religion in fact religious figures are actually modifying figures in both armenia and azerbaijan uh both societies are highly secular and uh um, and if you look at the alliances you know one side azerbaijan turkey iran the other side armenia iran russia it's hard to say these are in any way you know on 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 the uh, cultural or religious lines. The only place that religion seems to be influencing the policy is the United States, where, where uh, I think the Armenian American lobby has done a very good job at trying to portray this as, as a Christian conflict and that the US should, should support Christians. And there are a lot of uh, support, I mean, uh, uh, groups in the US that that ma you know, matters to them. And so if, if it's influencing anyone's policy, it's the US and I find that pretty, you know, pretty sad. That's not the United States that I grew up in, that its foreign policy is based on, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a Christian line. And I think, I hope that will be caught and reversed because that's really not, not, not the American way. Um, for Israel, I think there's some interesting things happening and especially things that could maybe affect even Israel-Turkish relations. So obviously very strong support from Israel uh, for Azerbaijan, uh, very clear. Uh, Turkey and Israel are on the same side here. And the question maybe is a question I asked to you and to the audience, does this create more of an opportunity for Turkey and Israel to, um, to improve its relations, cooperation? Bottom line, in my opinion, I can't think of one issue of bilateral on the bilateral agenda between Turkey and Israel. I don't know of one border that they share, not you know, or one one refugee, one security, you know, one security uh, on, a, on the bilateral agenda. 
Um, so I, I would like th this could be, you know, potentially kind of a re an opportunity for repivoting here. Uh, an interesting element, I would say that Israel's even getting soft power inside Iran with uh, Iranian Azerbaijanis seeing that it's very clear that Israel is helping Azerbaijan and, uh, uh, and with great enthusiasm always among Iranian Azerbaijanis for Turkey, but also now a lot for Israel. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, um, pretty surprising. Um, and then just maybe two, uh, two sort of general points, and I'll, I will wrap it up. Um, one, this is very, I think we should be, everyone who studies war, studies strategy, studies international relations, needs to look at this war. This is a very 21st century war. Um, soldiers are not face to face. Soldiers are not in trenches. Um, a, a lot of this is taking place, you know, with equipment that's being operated outside of the war zone. Uh, uh, we're seeing the supremacy of the Western, you know, US, NATO standard, but with Turkish and Israeli, uh, maybe improvements, the supremacy of these weapon systems over the Russian weapon systems, that might be difficult for, for Russia moving forward. Um, we're seeing civilian population and energy infrastructure clear, you know, involved targets. There's no, there's no uh, rules. This is 21st century, and then sophisticated disinformation being a big part of the 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 warfare. Um, so I think I think we'll be studying this a long time um, about how we fight war now. And then on the other side of studies, and I'm glad we're at, we're at Hadoukas University, and I know a lot of friends from universities in the Caucasus are also listening in. I think basically international relations, you know, well, let's just say, we, I think we've duped the students for the past 30 years, studying international law, international institutions, conflict resolution, track two, track three, you know, in the, I don't know, Azerbaijan waited 30 years, you know, believed in all this, these institutions, what the West was telling them. And then the end you see, well, if you know, you wanna change a status quo, basically the, the military does it, easier and quicker than uh, any, anything else and, uh, um, you know, creates a new reality. And uh, I don't know what international institutions, conflict resolution groups, uh, dip, you know, diplomacy, what it, what it offered uh, ever to resolve this conflict. So thank you. Hey, great, great. Thank you, uh, Miranda. It's good to have experienced speakers, you know, they just uh, guess the questions that I'm going to ask and they respond to them before asked. Um, so it's very good. Um, I have a, a, a small reminder to the, to the attendees, uh, and those who are watching this panel. Uh, if you are in Zoom, uh, you can ask your question in the Q&A uh, part of the uh, application. If you look down uh, in the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A &A part there. You can ask your questions there. We are not going to allow people to ask uh, uh, live questions. So if you write there, uh, we will try to answer. And also those who are watching uh, through the Facebook, uh, you can write your questions there in the Facebook and we, we will get those questions to ask to the speakers. So now um, the last speaker of tonight uh, of webinar is Mitat Çelikbala. Uh, he is, again, uh, looking into the situation as a whole and giving us his opinion. I also ask him to uh, maybe a little bit more concentrate on Turkey, Russia, and Georgia as a regional country. Nobody talks about Georgia, even less than uh, Iran, actually. <laughs> so uh, Georgia is caught up in all this uh, co uh, conflict. Only uh, South Caucasus country who's not part of the conflict. So it should be a difficult position. Mitad. Thank you, thank you very much, Hocam. It's my pleasure as well uh, to take part in this this activity. Uh, this is the lively issue in those days. Uh, and uh, as we are discussing, Azerbaijan and Armenia are involving in heavy fighting in this supposedly frozen conflict, despite the fact that Russian brokered ceasefire is on the table. And for the first time, the parties do not take part and do not take it and continue their their. their uh, fighting uh, and obviously Azerbaijan had been preparing for this eventuality. Uh, their country strike was not a spur of the moment reaction. It was well organized and uh, studied one. Uh, the fighting is the worst it has been uh, since 1992 most probably and encompassing the entire line of contact 
uh, with the artillery, missile and drone strikes, uh, the past Armenian lines, as Brenda mentioned, changed the, the, the strategy of war in the region. And with the success, it's a different kind of a development for the fight uh, between the armies. And this war, and therefore this war features modern weaponry representing a large scale conventional conflict between uh, these two states, which will be, which uh, will undoubtedly change the long-standing status quo in the region, uh, and for the likelihoods of this conflict becoming a broader regional war, uh, this is low, uh, but it should not be dismissed uh, a distant war between small states, and this is the case, and this is very important in this region. Uh, in other, in other words, how, how can I say, conflict paving the way for a new logic of escalation, uh, which the likelihood likelihood of a, a major war uh, is increasingly obvious, maybe not this time, but in the near future, that's a possibility within the region itself. Uh, and how can we understand uh, or much of the coverage of this conflict centers uh, on what pillars? Uh, I may say that three of them, and then afterwards I may move to uh, Turkey, uh, maybe Russia and Georgia, other regional actors as well. The first one is, uh, again, the, the other previous mentioned erosions. There was a formal negotiation uh, that was law 92, uh, which had essentially produced no concrete results on the ground. And this is a serious issue for almost 30 years, uh, three decades. And occupation has continued and Azerbaijani refugees and IDPs have been prevented uh, from exercising their own right of return. And for nearly three decades of OSCE-led negotiations, whose object objectives were uh, clearly and unambiguously set down on a paper, none of uh, the Minsk group's defined objectives have been achieved, not even close. And the end result is uh, this, this clashes. And secondly, uh, we see a kind of a merger between uh, geopolitics of the Middle East, the Caucasus, Black Sea region, and uh, Eastern Mediterranean, many actors are involving in this uh, new geopolitical environment and the new actors, geopolitical actors, in fact, those actors are over there uh, already, but for the international community, those new actors, for example, Turkey and some others are involving in this new geopolitics and this new geopolitics is totally different than uh, 1990s ge geopolitics. The third one is the most uh, to a kind of approach to, uh, and the negotiations since uh, the Velvet Revolution and then Azerbaijani's response to this development. Uh, from that point on, uh, there are many discussions. Uh, all of those regional actors and leaders are criticizing Turkey to, to, to involve in this issue militarily. Uh, even the uh, Armenian prim Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan stated that the international community must strongly condemn aggressive actions and aggression of Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, as well, uh, demand that Turkey leaves the region as a military presence of, of Turkey in South Caucasus uh, does not promise any good. This is the uh, evaluation of uh, Pashinyan, uh, an Armenian side. Uh, this aggressive actions and aggression of Turkey and Azerbaijan is wrong and unfair for Turkey's decision makers. This is an is, is irresponsible and baseless statement. This is not, of course, my uh, evaluation, but the, the evaluation of Turkish prime president and Turkish foreign minister. Officials declined these accusations and Turkish troops are uh, not the front line. Uh, there are many accusations of Turkey's involvement, uh, including those, those radical uh, groups from Syria or Libya and different regions. Uh, and, and technically, it seems that Azerbaijanis do not need such a kind of a support from Turkey and or, or involvement of all those actors. Uh, for Turkey, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey share strategic ties and brotherly relations and it's on one nation, two states. It's very famous and we know it. Uh, and for Turkey, Azerbaijan and rated its support to Azerbaijan against Armenian border attacks, according to a national security statement last week. And, Turkey is actively supporting Azerbaijan, and President Erdogan uh, condemned the 
mean, in occupation of Azerbaijan territory and call its aggression and withdraw from Azerbaijani lands and it's occupying. We see Turkey for the first time involving very actively what's happening between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Turkey was always there, uh, but this time very overtly, openly declaring its support. Uh, and then Turkey's support is the key to understand the strategic timing of Azerbaijan's counterattack, I guess. Uh, because, you know, we know Ankara remains Baku's uh, key military ally and Turkey is already supporting Azerbaijan militarily through technical assistance, through arms sales, uh, providing a critical military support, especially in terms of armed drones and technical expertise. Uh, and this, this bilateral defense cooperation between Turkey and Azerbaijan defines two legal, legal frameworks, a new, not a new phenomenon. It's an old and constructed cooperation between Turkey and Azerbaijan. Uh, the first one is uh, which was established in the uh, early 1990s, uh, enables military training for Azerbaijani personnel in Turkish military institutions, both in Azerbaijan uh, and in Turkey. And the second framework is uh, much more important than that. This is this uh, kind of strategic partnership agreement, as you know, uh, which explicitly states that the two countries will help each other uh, if uh, one of them demanded its right to self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations, Nations Charter. <clears throat> this is very important for Turkey and Azerbaijan. And although the nature of this assistance was subject to a bilateral consultations, the agreement clearly affirmed the possibility of using military means in the emergence of circumstances. And today we have new news. And th those news mention this uh, Armenian assault to Nakhchivan region and other cities of uh, Azerbaijan. And this is a serious concern. Uh, and therefore we have to follow what's happening on the field uh, very seriously. Uh, what, what, what is else beyond that? Why Turkey is there? Uh, we see Turkey from the beginning and you, know, you should remember uh, this Trabzon declaration of 2012 uh, between Turkey, Azerbaijan and Georgia that links Azerbaijan and Georgia to the issue, uh, Turkey is establishing its own caucuses in this geography uh, with the participation of Azerbaijani and Georgian partners uh, and Turkey's interests are aligning with the West, not with the Russia in this new caucuses. Therefore, we need to see Turkey's situation from this perspective. Uh, and as we all know, the mutual distrust prevailing in the region uh, has consequently that these countries uh, to the uh, region and to pursue a kind of a cooperation uh, with the actors of the, the, the side of the region. In this federation, both as a regional and a global power uh, or player that could be defined as a cooperation state due to its connection with the Northern Caucasus, of course, keeping the region. On the other hand, we have Turkey and Iran as the other regional actors. Uh, or regional powers, which play an effective role in shaping the region with the, their historical, cultural, and contemporary links and interests. Uh, and then, especially since the collapse of the Soviet Union, we were part of the, those discussions for a long while. Uh, two main strategic axes of alliance, the strategic axis of Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia, vis-a-vis -vis the strategic axis of Armenia in, and Iran. Uh, this is very important, and we see the, the signals, and, but there are some changes as well. Uh, for example, whereas the latter axis accepted the continuation of a traditional structure, which assumed the domination of Russia's regional expectations and the geopolitical subregion excluded from the rest of the world, the former and Turkey, uh, Georgia, and Azerbaijan reflects the effort, effort of constructing a pro prosperous pluralistic and modern region with Euro-Atlantic alliance as well. But last couple of years, we see that the, those regional actors are uh, far away from uh, attracting the attention of the West, including US and the UN as well, uh, EU as well. Therefore, we have a different region. And for Turkey and Russia, uh, is there a possibility to, to, yes, that is the case, but uh, I see a kind of a, uh, uh, covered an uh, agreement between two parties, Russia and Turkey, because, you know, the two actors has a uh, kind of an experience in Syria, in Iraq, in East Mediterranean and other regions. 
uh, to discuss those issues. I, I don't want to say that they, they agree to change the structure or geopolitical environment in the Caucasus and other regions, but the parties have a kind of an agreement or kind of a, uh, experience to discuss some issues. Uh, and this, this one is one of them. And why they are acting as, as they are in need of change the environment in the Caucasus because of uh, different stuff. Uh, Brenda mentioned energy cooperation and Azerbaijani's activities with Georgia to link the, the other part of the Caspian to the West uh, and China is uh, involving in this issue. And for the first time they pass through the, the Caspian and we see trade relations in the middle corridor. And this the middle corridor, corridor is very important. And this is a kind of a, an alternative to, to the North and South. In the North, we have Russia. In the South, we have sea lines. And it's very collaborated with this China's Road and Belt Initiative as well. It seems that Russia is in need of changing its attitude in the Caucasus. If, if they would like to take part in those activities, they have to play in a different kind. In, in this line, uh, who is losing uh, or the loser is, is Armenia. Uh, Armenia is out of all those regional initiatives and, and it's very serious concern for Armenia. And for Georgia, we, we see very silent Georgia in all those developments, uh, but it is very important for Georgia because Georgia has uh, its own experience with Russia in 2008. Uh, and now all the regional actors looking the, at the issue from this perspective, most probably, and therefore they try to be more silent and trying to observe what's happening. And this is a case for Turkey, for the first time we see active Turkey, but there is another first for most probably in the region, Iran, Iran, Iran's leader, Supreme Leader Khamenei, uh, have a statement, and for the first time in the Broadway, he it, say, said that uh, Nagorno Karabakh is Azerbaijani territory, international. There is no doubt on that. Therefore, this is also a game changer. It seems that Azerbaijani operations are still going on, and it will have some effect on the region, and and those effects will survive for a long while. Maybe the parties get together, uh, Azerbaijanis may stop at the border of Nagorno-Karabakh for the new negotiations, but the environment has totally changed, Rojam, and then most probably we will see new discussions and new negotiations under those circumstances, and most probably, we don't know yet, Turkey will be on the table uh, together with the other actors, but we will see a much more active Turkey with the support of Azerbaijanis and most probably the other actors uh, without consent, welcome to Turkey, those, those kind of a role. Uh, let me stop here. I give some clues, most probably for the questions, depending on the questions and other comments, I may broaden up my, my, my comments. And, and uh... Okay, thank you very much, Mithat. Uh, we have actually several questions uh, from the audience coming. Um, so let me start with them, instead of asking my questions so that they don't feel uh, left out. Uh, if we can get, go through all those questions, then I'll start asking my questions. Uh, let me start with Niku. A um, couple of questions is directed to you, and I'll add two. Uh, one of them is uh, a, from a Turkish participant who is asking about the ENP, whether ENP uh, could be an instrument uh, for the frozen conflicts in the neighborhood region and, of course, in the South Caucasus. Uh, could normative power of Europe play a constructive role uh, in this region? That was the one question. Another question, again, to you, uh, Miku, is about Georgia. Actually, Mita talk about, talked already about this, but maybe uh, you can also like to uh, delve into this issue. Um, uh, what is the impact of the conflict on Georgia and whether Georgia would have a possibility of meaningful role as a mediator or at least a venue for the talks. Uh, of course, this is from a Georgian uh, attendee. Uh, uh, so that's also the question. Uh, and uh, maybe you just start from there. And if you have some expectation how this conflict will evolve from now on, uh, I would like to hear that also myself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will start by taking the question on the European neighborhood policy. Listen, it's hard for the European Union to do something somewhere where the local actors 
don't really want the EU to do much. And in this sense, as long as, as Armenia and Azerbaijan do not really have an interest of really getting the EU on board, the Europeans are in a situation where they cannot force and impose their role on this. Of course, the EU will have, and the EU member states will make diplomatic statements, but there is not a way for the Europeans to act in any military or massive economic slash financial way without the sides to the conflict wanting it. And as you see, Europe is actually not very good at playing significant roles in war situations, like in Libya, like in Syria, like in Nagorno-Karabakh now. That's the nature of the European Union. Having said that, I think the EU played a major role in, you know, making sure the war in Ukraine doesn't grow much bigger by imposing sanctions on Russia. That's a bit of an exception. But if we're not talking, you know, EU sanctions on the these conflict sides, I don't see the EU playing a big role before the sides agree on something. If and when Armenia and Azerbaijan agree on something, then the Europeans, I'm sure, will find a few billion euro to do post-conflict rehabilitation in the conflict zones. If this needs to sweeten the peel of the deal for the Armenian and Azerbaijani publics outside the conflict zones, I'm sure there will be funds for that. And there will be, you know, peacekeepers if the EU is asked. But before Armenia and Azerbaijan agree on something, it will be hard. Georgia. To be frank, I don't think the problem Azerbaijan and Armenia have is lack of good mediators. Uh, the problem they have is different. Again, you need a good mediator when both sides kind of think they should solve the conflict. And this is where you get a neutral mediator, you know, Norway in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process or Switzerland in lots of other situations. Now, Armenia and Azerbaijan don't really look like they desperately need a good mediator. They want something else. So now the only way foreign actors can actually push them towards a solution is through pressure. And this kind of pressure, Georgia is not in a position to apply. And that's why I think at this stage, we're still going back to the kind of bigger players who mediate while at the same time are in a position to force the hands of Baku and Erevan. And that's back to, you know, Russia, to France, to the United States and Turkey now. And if I can allow you, if you allow me to take one question on why, why is Armenia targeting Azerbaijani towns and Ganja specifically? I mean, there is no way Armenia can resist just by fighting a localized war. The only chance for Armenia to resist is to impose higher costs on Azerbaijani population. And that's a way to offset Azerbaijani military superiority and equipment at this stage. And this is where this war cannot stay localized because a localized war favors Azerbaijan because it has better drones and better other things, which were not. And Armenia will escalate this war be beyond the uh, occupied districts and beyond Nagorno-Karabakh, but th that's the only way it can inflict damage on Azerbaijan in the hope of sending the message no, it won't be about bombing some empty territories around Nagorno-Karabakh. It will also hurt, you know, and that's the situation of war. So in this sense, this is one of his drivers that shows that this war cannot be contained and will not be just in Jebrail and Kalbajar and, you know, Stepanakert or Hankendi, as you want to call it, right? And that will be a dynamic that is there as long as the fighting continues. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Miku. Actually, this answers the uh, question of uh, Furkan Terzi also, and maybe partly um, in Alcevikas, but I will ask in Alcevikas question to Brenda Sheffer too. Uh, he is asking about 
the, the shelling of Machuan, uh, which is uh, closer to uh, in in areas closer to Iranian uh, border rather than uh, the north. Uh, what is the tactical motive here? Um, that's the question. The bombing, uh, maybe presumably joining the Megri corridor uh, or not? Um, that's uh, that's a kind of a strategic question, of course. Um, there was a, a on the Facebook side. There is an, a, a question directed to Brenda from a Armenian participant. Uh, I think she is saying that uh, Azerbaijan was uh, bombing Stepanakert Tankendi before a week before uh, anything was uh, hit Ganja. Uh, why do you think that? What do you think about this? Uh, there are a couple of questions about Turkey and Israel. Actually, you opened up uh, the question, of course. Uh, uh, one of the questions is whether Israeli, um, Azerbaijani and Turkish Azerbaijani cooperations would help to develop um, Turkish-Israeli relation. Of course, this is what you opened up. Uh, maybe you, you might follow that question. There is a, a specific question on energy. Maybe um, you would like to take that from Pnaripek uh, from Turkey. Uh, to what extent the ongoing conflict would have an effect on increasing the TANAP pipeline capacity? Would it postpone Shahtenis phase three or cancel potentially bringing Turkmenistan gas for uh, TANAP? Um, and there is a question uh, from our Ukrainian friend. Volodymyr Dubovik uh, from Odessa University. He's asking about the U.S. position. It's, uh, he says that U.S. Uh, U.S. is not notably missing in the discussions uh, and on the ground. And some people uh, lamented this, and people are uh, talking, complain about this administration's uninterested and disengaged position. But the question is. Would it be realistic to expect more active and effective intervention on the part of some other administration? Does the U.S. have any leverage here? So that, those are the questions for you. Great. Okay. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, first thing on the escalation and the involvement of uh, civilians. Um, so uh, I, I, as as pointed out, I, I think. Um, Defense Minister Totonian's uh, uh, strategy is very, you know, very clear here. Move it out of, as as Nico uh, Nico also said, um, not to focus on the occupied territories, but try to move it, whether it's to Nakhchiva and Ganja, other places. I think what doesn't work with this strategy is that how Azerbaijani society has changed fundamentally since the early years of the war in 1992, 1994. Azerbaijan's become a real state. You know, at the time there was hardly really, during that war, hardly really a, a full military. Uh, it was very, you know, divided period in, in, in Azerbaijan. Today, you know, no one is going to flee their homes. No one, despite what it, the shelling and the uh, people are not going to, um, you know, Turn against the the government. They they they're actually you're seeing a sort of very wide uh, sort of mobilization, including of uh, the Azerbaijani political opposition. You know, in 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 favor of this uh, uh, war effort. So I don't I don't think that while well, it's clear it's the Armenian strategy, I, I don't think it's going to work in the way that it worked in the early 90s. No one's going to get you know is going to flee the the the, the zone, uh, the the military zones. Um, Se second, well, the the, the shelling of, of Stepanakarn Khan, Khan Kendi, um, clearly, and, and you see by the sort of the pace of the Azerbaijani military, their 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 um, doctrine right now is try to remove military targets before they actually go in with soldiers. Again, this is a very high tech war war taking place. It's a uh, it's not like the line of contact has been for the past thirty years. We really. You know, I've, I've been there, I've been to the line of contact. You really have, it almost is like World War I. You know, we have trenches where you see soldiers basically looking at each other. This is a completely different warfare, more like how the U.S. fights part of the war in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, where someone could be sitting in Colorado with a joystick and, and you know, 
hitting military targets from physically, you know, physically being very far away. So, so clear, you know, clearly they want, Azerbaijan wants to remove the uh, military forces in uh, Shusha and Stepan Kerkhan Kendi um, before they even, you know, approach uh, the, those areas. Um, definitely it's a, it's a opportunity for uh, Turkey, Israel. Um, again, it's, it's a kind of funny, uh, I, I can't say it conflict because I can't think of one issue in you know, what conflict. Uh, Brenda is frozen, I think. Dimitri, is it the same for you here? Yes. All right. We're back. Are you back, Brenda? Yes, you are oh, yeah, back. Yeah. Go ahead. So I started talking about Turkey and Israel and then it froze. Exactly, know. yes. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so so um, clearly it's an opportunity. I don't see one issue on the bilateral agenda. They have, Turkey and Israel have some different issues related to third parties. On the bilateral agenda, if someone could tell me about any disputed territory between Israel and Turkey, any refugees, Turkish refugees, Israeli refugees that somehow, you know, in any way that they directly uh, impinge on each other's security, that would be uh, 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 surprising. Um, and, you know, I think that Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan's position is very popular among Turkish society. Uh, you know, we saw this when Turkey tried to do the Zurich, the, uh, the Geneva protocols and to forge, you know, relations with, with Armenia and how unpopular this was without resolution or some sort of advancement in the, in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. So I, I think the fact that Israel and Azerbaijan have a close relationship, like I said, I think it gives it soft power in Iran for Israel and also, um, you know, kind of reawakening the idea, hey, really, why are we in a, why is there a conflict between Turkey and Israel? We stand, we have a lot of common issues on, you know, many, on, on many issues. You know, including, including Syria, including, uh, you know, in, and in the Caucasus. Um, Pinar's question on the energy. So yeah, I think something that some of the press is missing is that, you know, the first stage as Pinar obviously knows that uh, there's 25 year contracts um, for, the, for the Southern Gas Quarter. They're already, you know, locked in place. There's, there's no question about the, the, the first phase. Um, I think part of the Armenian Russian interest in the July attacks was to, try to influence what would happen with the second phase, meaning that, you know, sort of maybe to, uh, to put a chill on, on um, consumer, on potential consumer interest. But so many things, you know, probably by the time that there's really concrete decisions about, about contracting a, you know, a second stage of, a third stage of Shaftanis or the second stage of the Southern Gas Corridor, probably um, things will be very different in the in the uh, battlefield. And and in terms of Turkmen gas, that's still far from a from a reality. So sure, this can have some impact, but I think there's bigger problems with getting Turkmen gas to to market um, than, than than just this this issue. And um, there's one more question. I think it's uh, it's to you also. Can Israeli support for Azerbaijan influence U.S. policy on the Nagorno-Karabakh war? Um, yeah, I, I um, you know, in in part partially, you know, because of the close alliance between Israel and the uh, United States, um, but I think because of the problematic relationship right now between Turkey and, and, and Israel, um, there's less appetite, let's say, among American Jewish organizations, um, you know, to take a stand on something in, in uh, Turkey's favor. I, I find, mm. I, I, um, I think that, um, you know, there's a, there's a very, it's, uh, it, it is, I think it's not so much connected to Israel, but more connected to um, you know, that, that part of the more problematic relations between Turkey and Israel are also spilled over in, into the uh, American Jewish arena uh, as well. Okay. Uh, Mita, there are some questions uh, similar actually to each other. So I will ask them all one after another. Uh, is, uh, one is, uh, is Nagorno-Karabakh turning into a proxy war between Turkey and Russia? Uh, that's from Melik, Melik Alkan. 
uh, a kind of a similar uh, question uh, from uh, anonymous attendee. When Turkey and Russia take sides for different countries in this, is this caused by tension among them? So it's kind of similar. Uh, another question, again, hinting the similar issue, was tension in the Middle East actually a hint of tension in the South Caucasus? Um, and another question, what will be the future of uh, Turkish-Russian and Turkish-Armenian relations be like? So maybe you can take both. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is an interesting question. I, I didn't know this at all. Uh, maybe it's just a speculation from, a, I think, an Azerbaijani uh, attendee, Yelena Abdulayeva. Uh, she's asking if whether there is an, any information from the Turkish government about resettling the Syrian refugees of Turkic origin into Azerbaijani liberated territories. This is presuming quite long. Azerbaijan liberates occupied territories and then there might be possibility of resettling Syrian refugees of Turkic origin into those territories. Uh, it seems that um, some Armenian sources uh, saying that there are already 15,000 settlers in Karabakh from Syria of Armenian origin. So whether this could be kind of in return uh, policy. Um, I think these are enough for now, this story. Mm -hmm. uh, Ojam, and it's, it's interesting, in fact, uh, the Russian um, Foreign Intelligence Service recently issued a statement, most probably you are aware of it, and they say that Nagorno-Karabakh, like a magnet, attracts militants from uh, very various kinds of international terrorist structures to the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Initially, you know, there were many accusations on Turkey that Turkey is uh, using mercenaries from international terrorist organizations fighting in the Middle East, mainly in Syria, uh, in particular, this Jabhat, Jabhat al-Nusra or Hamza and Sultan Murad divisions, whatsoever, some extremist groups as well. Uh, but, you know, from we have some many examples since the Chechen war or the 1990s, all those radical groups are moving one region, one spot to another, from Afghanistan to Pakistan, uh, from uh, Chechen, Chechnya to, to, to uh, of course, Syria. Now in Libya, there are many rumors. And, but I don't think that there is well set or organized activity or movement of all those groups. And today, uh, Turkish Defense Ministry spokeswomen uh, give a talk, and it was so strange that uh, and some external actors, uh, official uh, officers, let me say, high level officers, uh, three star general is conducting. Armenian or Nagorno-Karabakh army and training those guys against Azerbaijani opal, uh, activities and, and fronts. There are many rumors. For, the, for that moment, we don't know. And even this uh, Russian uh, intelligence service uh, statement, it has many wrong statements and wrong perspective. Most probably we may see some, some other names or uh, groups that try to support uh, different parties in the in the action. There are other uh, articles I read from, for example, from Lebanon or Syria that those Armenian groups are moving to Nagorno-Karabakh to fight against Azerbaijanis whatsoever. Uh, but we don't have any clear uh, information. But this is a fertile ground for, for all those groups and mercenaries to be active on the on the spot. Uh, therefore, I don't know. But from this Russia stuff. I don't think that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or Syria is a kind of a proxy war between Turkey and Russia, you know, because, you know, uh, both actors are not uh, equal to each other and they have their different activities. I have to, I, 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 many times I'm just saying that Turkey's and Russia's interests and vital interests are much more different than each other. They, uh, in, in all those neighboring regions, uh, in the Caucasus, in the Middle East, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but those parties, uh, Turkey and Russia, I mean, have a, an experience very lately that to, to work on those issues. But both parties fail to offer any resolution to any issue in all those regions. They just follow the status quo 
uh, to utilize and to use those issues for the sake of having some some interest <laughs> on realizing their power in those regions. But the Caucasus is a little bit different than uh, Middle East, Syria and Iraq. Uh, we have to be careful on this issue. What is different most probably is we see active involvement of Turkey for the first time at that level, uh, militarily I mean, but this is not a kind of a proxy war. Uh, most probably parties are in need of balancing. And from this point, is it possible to see any kind of a new face in, in Turkish Armenian or Turkish or Russian Azerbaijani relations? Let's see. But I don't see any prospective uh, initiative from our Armenian side uh, to normalize the issue under those circumstances, especially since those rapprochement processes, Turkey uh, take this, this is part and I don't expect any kind of a change in this development. For Turkey and Russia, uh, we are going to see the limits of cooperation. Uh, for the moment, parties are managed to look at the, 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 the full side of or the of, uh, positive aspect of the relationship, but still going on. Uh, let me say some, some short words for this uh, UNAL based comment. Most probably I agree with Brenda uh, the Armenian side is trying to broaden the front uh, in different pieces and to uh, distract the attention of Azerbaijani military force, most probably in different uh, parts of the front. Uh, or they may try to push Turkey to mobilize or at the, to move to, towards the border. We don't see any kind of a mobilization of Turkish army or troops in the Eastern Anatolia or in the, the other the Armenian border as well. And they do. Mr. They, they Mr. Are, can they, I can I ask you as well? They take into account that Turkey has a guarantee regarding Nachivan, uh, not ah, similar yeah. guarantee to Azerbaijan, but there is a Turkish guarantee for the Nachivan. So maybe you should think about this and answering as well. Exactly from the beginning, for as as far as Nachivan is concerned, and. and Turkey's involvement in the region since 1990s, early 1990s, is a serious issue, an historical thing. You just remember what happened in, 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 the, in, in Georgia uh, in 2008. You remember in Batumi, for example. Historically, many people in the region, even in the region, believes that Georgians as well, uh, Turkey has some guarantees or, or, or some basic uh, legal rights in all those regions to protect the status quo. And therefore, this is the case. If uh, Armenian side taking this issue uh, into account and trying to push Turkey to the field, it's, it's, it's going to be a regional war. But I don't think that Azerbaijanis and Turkish side uh, play this game because, you know, it has some uh, serious effects on all those regional developments. And for, for the region, Middle East and the Caucasus, it's already linked to each other. You remember Russian operations in Syria, in northern Iraq, they use this Caspian and Azerbaijani airspace very actively, and therefore it's, it's the case. And therefore, we have to be careful in this, in these kind of developments in the region. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we are uh, almost towards the end, but the questions keep coming. Uh, but let me have one more um, round. Uh, and uh, and I will ask you to talk about your own uh, views about the future. How are we going to uh, go from here? Uh, maybe also um, you would answer some of the questions as well. Um, Niku, about, there is a question about France. What agency do you think France can have? as a mediator in the conflict, given Aliyev's recent declaration. Um, I think, yeah, you could take this as well, but also give us your view for the future and then uh, we'll move on. Okay, thank you. Um, it's hard to say what will happen with the French role. Um, I see these tensions, but you know, I mean, that is why mediators are mediators because they're not supposed to be entirely playing on the side of one or the other actor. And, you know, for all of Russia's neutrality, uh, tactical neutrality at this stage, um, you know, that's not strategic neutrality. I think for Russia it's pretty obvious that 
Armenia is an ally for the longer term. Um, Azerbaijan might regain some territories, but Russia's red lines, uh, in my view, are not entirely you know, in accordance with what Azerbaijan considers as its legitimate end game over Nagorno-Karabakh. There was a question as to whether, you know, Stepanakert is a Russian red line. And I don't know, but my feeling is that Nagorno -Kar most of Nagorno-Karabakh might be a Russian red line. Otherwise, it gets too much. It's becoming too much of a Russian disrespect of allies and humiliation almost. So I would not... That's now on Turkey, Russia, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, you see Russia being extremely careful in, in its messaging on Turkey. You see Russian uh, resilience and appetite to, to be on good terms with Turkey at incredibly high levels. You know, the smallest statement from some European, let alone American country, immediately provokes a lot of irritation in Moscow and a pushback. And what we've seen in recent years, you know, from the shooting down of the airplane, from the assassination of the Russian ambassador uh, in Turkey, to what is happening now, you see Russia having incredible amounts of capacity to overcome this tactical irritants in relations with Turkey and get back to a positive agenda. That's still the case. Uh, and I think the big game in Russia's mind around it is that Russia see that now it's a great moment that it needs to ram in delinking Turkey from the rest of NATO and the Euro-Atlantic community. And all of this Russian desire not to be irritated by Turkish action, either in Libya or in Syria or in Nagorno-Karabakh, has behind this belief in Russia that there is a momentum of pushing forward and deepening the rift between Turkey and the United States and Europe. And this momentum is something that serves Russia well, and that serves as that's part of a Russian desire to grind American power down, if you want. That's my reading. And I think Russia will have this resilience and, you know, will treat Turkey very, very positively as long as Russia still plays this game and as long as it thinks that this rift between Turkey and the rest of NATO can be deepened. Once the break is there, I'm not sure Turkey will be this respected and uh, carefully managed ally. Uh, I don't know, we can project things into the future, but uh, Russia being nice to Turkey is done for, for very specific purposes. It's not done, you know, as a kind of way to respect Turkish interest. It's, it's done to weaken America. And once this is done for Russia, there's all kinds of opportunities vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and many other places. Thank you, Niku. Um, so Brenda, same question to you. Uh, how do you see this conflict is playing out? And also, there is a question uh, regarding possible Joe Biden presidency. Would it increase U.S. involvement in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and how? But, okay, I'm very much interested. How do you see this conflict is panning out now? Right. So I think it's far um, from over. Um, as I pointed out, um, important changes have taken place in Azerbaijani society statehood over the last 30 years and, um, and, and also the successes in the battlefield. If, if up until maybe six months ago, uh, Armenia always could have had at any juncture, uh, you know, uh, all of the areas where traditionally Armenians have settled, um, let, let's recall going back to the, uh, the protocols that, you know, basically Turkey had offered Armenia if they would just uh, deoccupy one district, one district with, you know, without, with, with barely, barely with any settlement, um, they basically could have opened up full relations and trade with Turkey. That in the world, even just getting out of one of these occupied districts would have probably put Armenia as the peace, the image of the peacemaker, 
Uh, once trade was open with Turkey, it would have created so many opportunities for Armenia. It would also lessen its its dependence on 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 Russia. But in 2010, Armenia was not willing to give up even one one district. Right. So obviously now the situ you know that the situation is uh, completely changed, and I'm not sure that Azerbaijan will go back to to any of those. Uh, Previous formulations and that uh, that that basically were to the Azerbaijani uh, to the Armenian uh, uh, advantage. Um, so I, I don't think this is over. I don't think this is just <clears throat> to grab some territory. Or, like I, I it, it's not like, for instance, something similar to uh, 1973, where Egypt was able to give Israel a big kick and then go into the negotiations. Uh, you know, kind of as equal partners and starting, you know, and, and, and sort of rechange the view of history and, and uh, create a, a peace agreement. I think, I think it's very uh, different and that uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think that this is just to set the stage for uh, negotiations. And also, I think something we're all mentioning that, you know, Russia's behavior is very different than in the past. I believe it's calculated. I don't think in any way, again, it's just happening by chance. But you know, we know Russia has so many levers to influence the outcome of the war, to stop the war. And so far it's let this continue. So, so there's new Russian behavior here that that's also a calculation that I think, I think you know, we don't, we don't really know exactly what Russia is trying to do. And, and uh, um, it's probably not like in the past where Russia just wants to convene some uh, negotiations and calm, you know, calm things down and, you know, and also be the peacemaker. So about uh, you know how would the Biden administration treat this uh, treat this conflict? I would say that, well, there's two potential answers. Um, it, you know, I think it's a bigger question right now in the United States. Um, there's really two polls, uh, major polls, and the uh, poll, not poll in terms of polls. I mean, P O L E uh, uh, polls in the Democratic Party, uh, more traditional Democrats, which which Joe Biden uh, represents or a more uh, what they call progressive side of the Democratic Party, probably Kamala Harris and the, you know, the Bernie Sanders um, coalition, which is still part of the Biden coalition. I mean, that it's not just Biden, but something wider. So the, the Biden team has some outstanding people who have a lot of experience on the Caucasus, Russia, Turkey. If that team is running, if Biden's elected, and if that team is running the foreign policy, it would probably be even some good news for Turkey. People that understand the strategic importance of Turkey have a lot of experience, um, you know, and see, seeing how important Turkey's role is for all the, you know, all the bordering regions, bordering regions of Turkey, um, and really some excellent and experienced people, people that you know many of you know. Um, but if the other poll of the Democratic Party has more influence over foreign policy, and then, then this could be, you know, not the traditional Democratic Party and something that's probably not so familiar. Maybe we saw this a bit towards the end of the Obama administration, um, but, but, it, but a completely different uh, type of foreign policy and approach to foreign policy. So I think it really will be dependent. I think it's a big question to Americans in general, you know, which poll of the Democratic Party is really, you know, the, the, the flag on. Good. Uh, we are all watching uh, <laughs> what's going to happen. Okay. Um, a question. Oh, where did I put the question? Ah, here. All right. Uh, Mithat, same for you, of course, how do you see this is playing out? Uh, but also two specific questions, maybe you can also take them. Uh, this is one is about the S-400 test being conducted in Sinop, or at least it's uh, speculated that it's being tested in Sinop. Is it a friendly gesture towards Russia? Uh, to come up with an expected shared understanding over the conflict in the Caucasus, or is it completely different issue at all? Uh, another question is about uh, uh, that uh, Turkey of today is not the Turkey of 1991. Uh, do Turkey now expert in security uh, to the Caucasus? So you took these two questions also, but also give me your last words so that uh, we can finish on time. You have about Four and a half minutes. Okay, Ujam. Uh, I agree. It's far from uh, over this this clash, and because why? There is a political will and determination in Azerbaijani side 
to resolve or liberate all those occupied territories, including Nagorno-Karabakh. And for Armenian side, it is a, an interesting and it's very important aspect of their national identity. And therefore, they do not want to leave those territories uh, very easily. And we saw this is the reason why we have three decades uh, frozen conflict there. Uh, but the Madrid friends principle is the basics of, of the limitation, most probably in the resolution of this issue, peaceful negotiations. Uh, but it, it necessitates uh, the end of uh, our Armenian military occupation of the, these lands and return of hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijani civilians to their homes, not the civilian, of course, refugees and other groups. Even the, the priorities, Azerbaijanis and international communities support to it. It seems that uh, yeah, once evident categorical patient to end moment. And it seems that uh, Yerevan has overplayed its hand and, and did not think Baku would respond decisively to what amounts to, to a war of attrition in part because of all it. They overestimated extent of their own external backing. This is a failure of Armenian statecraft most probably. Therefore, I don't see any uh, easy end to this conflict. For for uh, this Turkey's involvement and the presence in the region, uh, I, I I'm not sure that Turkey is exporting uh, insecurity to the region. And Turkey's attitude is the same uh, in the region and all those agreements with the with Azerbaijan and Georgia and other regional countries uh, actors show that Turkey is is there and this is an active uh, part of Turkish foreign policy. And there are very critical aspects of it. Uh, we are part of those criticisms in Turkey as well, a very aggressive Turkey, instead of being a soft power, uh, like uh, what happened in the last two decades in the region, uh, partly Turkey is changing its attitude domestically and externally. And this is a serious concern for many Turks as well. Uh, but I don't think that Turkey will be a kind of irredentist and then fighting force in, in the Caucasus or in other regions for the moment because of the geopolitical aspects and the realities of the region. For S-400 stuff uh, being tested, it's a new stuff. And they moved to those, those um, but S-400s to, to Sinop, the Black Sea coast. It's far away from the South or Ankara as well, or the West, the Turkish Greek or uh, what's happening in Cyprus and there were very new rumors it was a surprise for many uh, because of, there is a field to test uh, available field to test those uh, infrastructure I don't know whether it's a gesture to Russia or to, to secure Turkey's uh, issues and, and attitudes just before the American elections uh, most probably Ankara is observing uh, Washington and elections and, uh, much more seriously than watching Moscow in those days. Uh, therefore, we don't, I don't know. And we just think this issue uh, from the words of uh, Russian foreign minister, he said Turkey is not our uh, ally, but a kind of a partner in different issues. Therefore, this is an, another message to Ankara from Moscow. Uh, most probably we think and we see new developments in the region. Uh, therefore, I don't take this as for another issue a serious sign uh, related with the Caucasus for the moment. We need to uh, to see some new developments afterwards. Let me stop here. Huh? Okay, this is excellent uh, because I, we planned 90 minutes and it's one minute less than 90 minutes. Uh, so uh, I have to thank now, first of all, to the attendees. They are uh, stick with us uh, tonight. Uh, both on the Facebook and also in the Zoom here. I'd like to thank them. And of course, our speakers, I mean, despite all the demands of uh, uh, home life from us, all of us, uh, we just briefly saw Niku's small keep there. Uh, I'd like to thank Mitat and Niku and Brenda. Thank you very much. It's been very nice to see you, uh, albeit in online. And also, of course, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Center for International and European Studies of Kandiras University and Panorama uh, Journal for putting up this event. Uh, we will have no doubt more. 
Dimitris, to you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you to Give all. Thank you for sticking to us, with us, and Niku in particular, who is pressed uh, with family issues. Uh, I was just thinking, the last thing I wanted to say, last week, uh, Mustafa and I were on a panel uh, for a Georgian university talking about the Black Sea, and one of our fellow panelists is someone who is part of the, of the Biden team, someone who actually said that the Madrid principles were written on his computer. And, 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 and he basically was saying to us that they're dead. I mean, that was his take on, on what's happening right now. And we are, I mean, it's just, I was just thinking about the whole conversation. So it's interesting linking that to what, uh, well, Ted Carpenter was telling us at that other event. So uh, it's something to consider, but this has been an incredible event. And uh, thank you, thank you very much to all of you for taking part. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you again. All let's hear in Istanbul. Hopefully. <laughs> well, maybe Monterey would be nice. <laughs> also, Monterey and Istanbul. And and Paris and Washington and everywhere else. We need to travel. Yeah. Uh, you know, Brenda, we cannot see each other even in Istanbul now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. 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 Bye.